Good to see you. Good to have you here. Gorgeous day. Um, things are going to turn pretty quick here, I think, now, going into fall. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to finally be out of the 100-degree days. My wife, she actually enjoys that. I told her she's not out in it enough. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so good to have you. And uh, back again for Trellis. Hope you're enjoying this book. It's a wonderful book. Um, and uh, it, it really takes us back to the scriptural mandate of discipleship uh, through and through. And, and so, again, for us to take uh, all fall to go through this is really, I think, of the Lord. And uh, already it's, it's sort of catching on. And I just want to challenge you because we are going to kind of hear from all the departments um, that are involved with Trellis. Um, and so if you feel led to share uh, a story of discipleship, either on the receiving end or on the giving end uh, of, of, a, of, of God's goodness through discipleship, you know, let me know because uh, we're going we're gonna to start creating some, some videos um, of people's testimony about, uh, uh, about discipleship. So I think that'll be great. And we're going to show it in the, in the, um, in the worship time on Sunday mornings going forward. I'm not sure when yet. I'll keep you, I'll keep you posted on that. So, uh, but we're excited about that. We want to share God's goodness and, and victories going forward, um, uh, throughout this series. So be thinking about that, praying about that, seeing how the Lord would use you to challenge and encourage the rest of the body as to this wonderful journey of discipleship and what the Lord's called us to do. Let me begin with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which we'll look at tonight. And we just pray that you will um, be pleased, Lord, to use us for your glory, uh, your kingdom calling on all of us, a command, really, to make disciples in all that we do. Lord, we praise you for tonight and for the things that we're going to look at from this second chapter of this book, and more importantly, from uh, your word. The principles are from you, and so we thank you. We praise you tonight. Go before us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, the book is The Trellis and the Vine. Um, we do have the cart here, out here with the books, and so if you didn't get one, uh, make your way over, even if you come in front of the camera, that's okay. Um, we want you to have one because we're going to be looking at it in our little breakout times uh, as tables. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to do some of that tonight, maybe for sure once, maybe twice. We'll see how we do with the clock. Um, so those books are there. The handouts are over here too. So we're going to need those. So if you don't have one, make sure you grab one off the, uh, um, the counter over here, okay? Um, okay. This is a series, as we've said, on discipleship, right? And uh, we are learning what it truly means uh, to make disciples. Last week we learned, we learned uh, that disciple making is not reserved for missionaries, for evangelists, for, for pastors. In fact, we saw uh, in, the, in, in that last week's study that the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers are responsible. They are, they are given to the church by the Lord for the primary responsibility of what? Equipping the saints for the work of ministry, uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of that from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Uh, and so that's, a, that's kind of a a text that I want you to get familiar with and make sure you know um, what it says. Because again, it all goes back to that. It brings us back to biblical truth that you and I are not here as lay people just to spectate uh, and sort of let the pastors do it. The biblical model is the pastors are here to equip you for that work of discipleship. And so that's so, so very important that we understand that. So last week we asked and answered some questions, didn't we? Okay. Questions like this. What is a disciple? What is a disciple? Uh, he is a scholar. He or she is a scholar, a learner, a follower of Jesus. 
right? How about the trellis? What is, what is trellis? Of course, you're sitting in one. And this is a study. This is a class. So anything that is, you know, a Bible study, a Sunday school class, a life group, uh, what we do on Sunday morning in the sanctuary, all of that is trellis in a way. And so the trellis, every vine, any healthy vine needs that trellis uh, to, to be healthy. What is the meaning of the vine? The vine is the fruit, of course. It's the fruit-bearing element. Um, and so we, we looked at that. What are, the, what are the trellises at Westside? We asked that question too. What are the trellises at Westside? How are they producing fruit, producing vine? So this week, we're going to look at um, some of the principles found in chapter 2 entitled Ministry Mind Shifts. Ministry Mind Shifts. And basic, basically, it is a look at where we're going, where we're going in this study. And so tonight, what we want to do is, is to sort of lay a scriptural foundation again, much like we did last week to start. We want to lay that scriptural foundation to hopefully do two things, okay? One, one, to get a hold of the gist of what is being said in this chapter, okay? And, and I think we're, that will be accomplished with this text we're going to look at. And secondly, to remove some of the fear that we may have uh, of opening our mouths and sharing Christ uh, with, with those whom God has entrusted to us. And we've got to think about that in, in those terms. We all agree in here, I think, I hope, that our God is sovereign and that there's no one in your life that is there by accident, um, by the quote-unquote luck of the draw. Uh, there is no such thing as chance with God. No such thing as the, as the, as the need to knock on wood um, or anything like that, right? No, God is sovereign and he, he works providentially in our lives. That means every conversation, every blunder even, is all accounted for in the economy of God, in the work of God. He is indeed sovereign. So if you look down the page of your handout to the little section called Evaluate, we're going to, to be just looking at number one to start with, which draws your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. Okay, um, what we're going to do is we're going uh, we're gonna to look at that text. Um, you see there that we're asking you to read and study that passage, which is precisely what we're going to do. Now, before we read it, I want to explain the setting a little bit. Paul here, with these words, is sort of... Um, reliving those far off days ago when he first came to Corinth, when he first came to this very, very pagan city uh, to give the gospel to the people there of Corinth. And he was not comfortable. He went in there in a very uncomfortable situation with pagan people hostile to God. And we too have come into situations where it's not comfortable. Uh, it's quite uncomfortable. There's some personalities that are a little harder to be around than others, right? You might have, you might have family that way. Uh, <laughs> I think we all do. Uh, I might be one. I don't know. Uh, of course, we all have our little glitches and our problems, don't we? So, Paul is there in this hostile situation. And he's reliving with these Corinthian people what that was like when he first came to Corinth and gave them the gospel. So let's read together 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And this is out of my uh, old boomer here, New King James. So listen as I read. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, 
but in the power of God. So it's important, I think, before we get into the, to, to our discussions here, that you understand that Paul was a very learned man. He was, of course, Saul of Tarsus, and he was high up in the Pharisaical uh, 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 hierarchy, and he had learned at the feet of a man named Gamaliel. He was a brilliant man, and he was under him for, for, for a long time. And so Paul's vocabulary was vast. You ever been around those guys who use words all the time that you don't understand? Um, that happens to us, doesn't it, sometimes, these learned guys. Um, and, and so what we learn from this, and we're going to get there, is that you and I, too, have been more trained maybe than we think. And we, too, can be guilty of, quote, unquote, Christianese, using terms, you know, that maybe we only know the meaning of. And so this is important to acknowledge this, that Paul, though he was very learned, made a decision as to how he was going to go about evangelizing and discipling people. So what I want you to do is, like last week, we did it a little later in the hour, but tonight we're going to do it a little earlier. I want you to take this little section here um, uh, and go through the, the text again, read it again, and then go through uh, A and B, questions A and B under number one, each table. And again, we'll take about 10 minutes, give or take a little bit. Uh, so go ahead and go through that and answer them as best you can, and then we'll talk about it when you're through. Okay, let's do it. Okay, neither Brian or I looked at our clocks when we started, so <laughs> we're, we're thinking it's got to be 10 minutes, because um, it is 623. So um, anyway, all right, I hope you had some good discussions around the text there, and uh, so let's just look at it briefly here. Um, so one of you maybe pipe up uh, from your table, and we're just going to, like I say, share together. We're all family here. So uh, again, the first question was, what was Paul's strategy for seeing souls saved and disciples made in Corinth? What was his strategy? Anyone? Not all at once. Just. Christ first. Christ, Christ first and only Christ. Christ first. Christ only. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Over here, Kenzie. Paul spoke very plainly so that the Spirit could work through him. There you go. Plain speech. Yep. Good. Very good. Yeah. Anybody else? Strategy. He stayed on topic. Just, yeah, stayed on topic. Good. Good. Yeah. Over here. Um, I think sometimes we think about uh, God using us in spite of our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right verbiage. I think it's, he uses, he uses those weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Not in spite of. Right. But no, you're right. Come yeah. to me with your hot mess and I'm going to you in the middle, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, hey, if we're yielded, who's the, let's go back a little bit. In church history, who do you think of? Who do you think of who, um, by worldly standards, was weak? Anybody think of this person I'm thinking of? You could probably think of several. But the one I, huh? Peter, not going way back. They're going back to the apostolic, yeah. What do you think? David. David? Oh, that's going way, way back. Yeah, David was just a just a shepherd, right? So no, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of someone like D.L. Moody. Okay? Here's a guy who had maybe a fifth grade education. You know? Uh, he go over to England and, and somebody over there said, Boy, there's no one that murdered the king's language like D.L. Moody. I mean, the guy, he, he had a hard time. Somebody said he was the only one they ever heard who could say Methuselah in two syllables. Um, he, was, he was just something else, you know. Uh, but the Lord used him. The Lord used him for the kingdom, didn't he? Somebody said he took England in one hand and America in the other and just moved them to God. And uh, he, was, he was a tremendous uh, servant. Again, weak. By anybody's standards, very untrained, unlearned, self-taught, uh, but but God used him, a, 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 an available, an available servant. Anything else on strategy tonight on Paul's strategy from the text? Humility. Humility. It's not all about me. 
Yeah, good. Not all about me. Yeah, good. Very much so. Very humble. Again, could he have gone off? Could he have used the big words and so on and so forth? You bet. Yeah, very learned guy. Okay. How about uh, the next one? Why is human weakness rather than strength such an important part of ministering the gospel? Human weakness rather than strength. And God gets the glory. Yeah, good. Yeah, what else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It allows the Spirit to work through our weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah, like we said earlier. You bet. Did I hear something over here? It causes us to depend on Him. To depend on Him alone. Yeah, good. Yeah. Excellent. Good answers. Anyone else on that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, we seek him the most when we're weak. Yeah, we don't see his glory either, quite as much as we do when we're than when we're um, when we're weak, for whatever reason that might be that we're weak. Yeah. So as you look at this text, um, I just want to read it again out loud um, because I think it bears repeating. And just to get a kind of a jump start in this, because so we're, we're going to look at it just a little bit more, not a whole lot. But uh, let me just read it again. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, when you hear that kind of terminology, the power of God on display in a situation of the of the proclamation of the word, what's the first thing you think of? Miracles. Miracles. Okay. What else? What do you think of? Change. Transformation. Change. Yeah. I feel like they're um, energized because mm -hmm. His power is coming through you. There you go. Energized because His power coming through us. How many times, though? Do you and I think of this sort of a, in a mystical sense that we're going to see something amazing or it's not the power of God? Anyone else do that? Yeah, very, very easy to think that direction. But I want to demonstrate for you that this is not at all what he was talking about. Okay. Look, uh, turn the page back to 1 Corinthians 1. And I want to show you this because this is going to provide, again, a really good catalyst, a really good uh, foundation of what we're doing in this chapter, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 and 18, very, very commonly known verses. Paul says here, and by the way, these are the two verses that transformed Martin Luther, okay? Okay. Uh, Actually, no, it was Romans 1. Sorry, we'll go to that one too in a minute. But 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, look at that. First of all, he says, um, you know, I didn't come to, to baptize, meaning he wasn't trying to downplay the importance of baptism, water baptism. He was just saying, hey, I got, I got my cohorts that do that work. Um, but God laid it on me to proclaim the gospel. And that's what he did. And, and he says, uh, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Somebody mentioned something along those lines a, a, a moment ago. How can lots and lots of words 
diminish the message of the cross? How can that happen? Huh? It gets lost in all the verbiage. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Um, and so Paul says, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Not going to do it. Uh, th there's no way I was, I was, I was going to descend to the place of using all these words. For, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's like one of my favorite preachers today, Steve Lawson. I love the way he puts it. He says, Mount Calvary is right in the middle of all humanity. It is the continental divide. The cross separates every human being. Because on one side, you, you've got this group that's not believed on the message of the cross. And on the other side, uh, you've got those who have. And just what, is, what does he mean by the message of the cross? This is the full revelation of what God has revealed about the cross of Christ and what happened there. Namely, two major headings. The person of Christ and the work of Christ. The person of Christ, meaning who is he? Well, it's the word made flesh, John 1. Uh, God the Son, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. That's who he is. God became flesh. And not only the person of Christ, but the work of Christ. Namely, his atoning death on the cross. And don't get it run off by that word atoning just means substitution he's our substitute the substitutionary death of Jesus paying the sin debt for all who put their trust in him and then of course his subsequent bodily resurrection from the dead Billy Graham was traveling in Eastern Europe and he came across and these men were traveling with him um, and he had been preaching for some time, or a couple of days anyway, I guess. And they were riding in the back of the car. And one of the leaders of the Eastern Church there, who was a believer, a firm believer in Jesus, believer in the gospel, he turned to Bill and he said, Mr. Graham, would you please give more attention to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because apart from the resurrection, there is no gospel. And he's right. And from that moment on, Billy put more emphasis on the resurrection. That same chapter 1, verses 22 to 24, Paul says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. See, what I want to show you is that the power here Paul is talking about is not something mystical. It's a message. It's a message, the message of the cross. That's the power of God. And so it's, it's, it's amazing what happens when you turn that loose. One more passage, and I'll just say a few more things on it. Romans 1. I was just talking about this with Martin Luther. That's the right passage I meant to say with him. Uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17. This is the text that... that uh, took Martin Luther to the ground. I mean, he, he was in training to be a priest and he would, he'd be on the floor of his quarters till late at night into the wee hours of the morning just confessing his sin. And he'd, and he'd drag himself to bed thinking he was all through and he'd lay there for two or three minutes. Oh, I forgot some others. Back on the floor he'd go. Confessing, confessing, confessing. Because he knew, he, or at least he was led to believe that he had to do his part if he was going to be redeemed. 
And so he happened to be studying Romans and he was reading, I believe it was Augustine's commentary on Romans 1. Came across this passage right here. Paul says, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? The power of of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith and he was reading Augustine's commentary on this and he was wrapping up his uh, exposition of the passage Augustine was, and he got to the end and almost in passing, like, oh, by the way, this righteousness is foreign. It doesn't inhere within you, as Rome teaches. It has to be given you from God. And, and Martin Luther just went to the ground, confessed his sin, and received Christ. He was reborn right there. It's just such an amazing truth that you're either trying to save yourself under your own dunamis, dynamic dunamis in the Greek, power, your own power or the power of God. Which is it? See, that's the gospel. So again, in summary, this reinforces what we discovered last week. Every time you open your mouth with the gospel, the message of the cross, Every time you open your mouth with that, the power of God is unleashed. It's on display. So now, with that as our foundation, knowing that when we proclaim the truths of the gospel, the power of God is on display, with that in our minds, let's ask and answer some questions that stem from chapter 2. And I want you then to go through these, um, and, and we're going we're gonna to look at these four under comprehension, okay? Comprehension. So again, let's do this uh, as, as, a, as each of your tables. Go ahead and go through those four, and watch now, I'm setting my alarm. All right? Let's go. Comprehension, one through four. So, um, hope you had some good interaction around those. And uh, um, so let's, let's dive right in. Number one, are the authors arguing that we stop doing trellis work and start doing vine work? Is that what they're saying? No. no. How, how, why do you say that? Well, if they were, the book would end right there. The book would end. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. That's one. That's one way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're done. Um, why else do you know that? What are they saying? Work is never done. You need to lay the foundation. Absolutely. Uh, well, just look at a look at a, a normal situation with with vine work uh, and the real ones right what what do they need is a trellis necessary yeah, yeah it is sure um, and if you get more vines you need more trellises you need more trellis that's right yeah yeah problem is a lot of our trellises they they get old they do don't they they get rickety they need paint they might even need some more might even need some structural work right so um, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I've shared this with you. So you know, the older I get, the more I repeat myself. So forgive me. Um, 
a lot of churches anymore, or there's some that I know of, um, that when they get towards the end of their fiscal year, what they do is they just take everything off the table. They, take, they, they wipe out every trellis they have, every ministry they have. They just take it off. They say, we're done. No more of that ministry. Knowing <laughs> that they're going to resurrect some for the coming year. But what are they doing when they do that? They're creating a mindset, right? That it's not necessarily about the trellis. It's about the vine. It is about the fruit that's coming from it. Because sometimes we get so attached, don't we, to our trellis. Um, I told you about when I first got here at Westside, I heard that uh, one of the early things when we started attending, uh, way before we came on staff, um, that there was no more Sunday school for adults. And again, I was like, what? No Sunday school, right? Well, what was happening is that trellis was getting old and tired, apparently. There was, attendance was going down. Uh, these, those that were teaching the classes were doing all this work in prep and so on, and the classes kept going down and down. So they decided to do Wednesday nights and offer some of the same kinds of classes then that was, would have been historically done Sunday morning. So I said, okay, okay. Uh, it's just a mind shift and, and they shifted the trellis around there. That's okay. Um, so number two, what are some of the problems with event-based evangelism? And what are some solutions to this problem? Look at that, you're even given the address. Page 18, paragraph four, <laughs> through page 19, paragraph, that was Joe, he did that one, so. Okay, what, uh, what do you think? What are some of the problems with event-based evangelism? Don't get new people coming in, only. Only the old people coming in. Yeah. Same old people? Same old people, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree, yeah, that could happen. What else? Event-based evangelism, yeah. You're depending on the unbelievers or people who need it to just find us. Rather exactly. Than, rather than equipping the church members to go out and talk to that difficult coworker and invite them to that right. event that they're probably needing. Absolutely. And in fact, yeah, bottom of 18, that sentence, the bottom of 18 that goes into 19, what's he say there? Are they going to come to our stuff? No. Now, it used to be. Now, I don't mean to diminish all event-based evangelism. I think it's great. I am a, I am a product of event-based evangelism because I came to Christ at the uh, 1982 Inland Empire Billy Graham Crusade, Spokane, Washington. Is that an event? Yes. Well, boy, oh, howdy. Yeah, it was. Um, and I think we had the last Sunday in little old Joe Alby Stadium, we had 38,000 people in there in a stadium that holds about 25, I think. Because we had them on the field. I got there early enough because my mom was a counselor. I got, I, got, I, I got there early enough for that. And so the people that were coming later, we put them on the field, on both sides of the field, up to about the 30 on both sides on the field. And I'll never forget showing up for that service out in the parking lot, outdoor stadium, uh, warm August evenings, and hearing, hearing the, that great choir warming up, about four or 5,000 people uh, on the 50 behind the platform uh, warming up. And it was just amazing, like heaven on earth. So not all event-based ministries are bad or wrong. Um, the problem is when we get dependent on them, right? We check the box. We got so-and-so to the event, we did our part. Um, and so that's, that's part of the problem, isn't it? Yeah. What else? Well, you're not meeting people where they are. Sure. Yeah. You have to, you have to adapt to where people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Not meeting them where they are. Okay. Um, and so I, I think what we're saying behind all of this too is that use it all. There's some event-based evangelism that's good. That's great and fine. But again, do it all. Do it all. Um, okay, 
Any other problems you can see with event-based evangelism? Any other? Huh? Dominate your life. Dominate? Yeah. yeah. Go, 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 go. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, all about the event, yeah. It's, what did you say? It's programmed and it's not led by Christ. Many times that can be true. Just a program, yeah. It can descend to that for sure. What were you saying? I was just saying that it often takes a lot of people to make it, make it, to make it go. So it's manpower and chill yeah. yeah. And a lot of times, unless you get that big name, it's a lot of work, a lot of work for, for very little um, return. Yeah. Okay. So we need to be prayerfully uh, careful uh, in planning these and saying, Lord, is this of you? You know, is this what you'd have us to do? I think that's good. Yeah. So number three, what does it look like for a ministry to be in maintenance mode? Maintenance mode. What does it look like for a ministry to be in maintenance mode? Leadership run around the church looking for people to fill some gaps. Filling gaps. Mm-hmm. Constantly filling gaps. Yeah. It's like sticking your finger in a leaky dime mm-hmm. and trying to plug each little hole. Yeah. 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 Um, some of the examples they use in this section and others uh, of the book. Um, you know, rather than looking at where so and so is gifted already and building a ministry around that gifting and training them in, in greater uh, effectiveness for evangelism, uh, we say, you know what, we got a need over in children's. Let's plug you in over there. And we completely ignore where this person's gift is and the people that could be reached through her or him. Right? Because we got this hole over here to plug. Yeah. Will you say something else, Dave? Well, yeah. The problem I have is that you're, you're talking about finding the, the person with, the, you know, using their gift or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Well, we've got to know those people. Right. And the leadership's got to know those people a mm-hmm. more somehow. I mm-hmm. mean, how do we know who to put in what position? Guess what? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Because, no, listen, hear me out. That's above my pay grade because that's a God thing. He, he works, doesn't he, providentially. In other words, let's say Ed here has somebody that he's met out on the job or whatever. And he says, you know, I, this, this person's unbelievable. He's got these gifts, talents, and abilities. I think we could, I think we, we could use him. Okay, where? What do you think? Well, his interests are over here in... You know, he's really active at the school, maybe even teaches at the school, or he's got, maybe he's a track coach like Jamie, we have our, our Jamie Nordstrom, something like that, or maybe they're a, a gal and they're, they're in volleyball, or they're, they've got these connections and in sports or whatever. You know what? Let's build a ministry of outreach through her or him to that arena because God's gifted her that way or made those connections and wired her for that kind of ministry with teachers, administrators, coaches, whatever, whatever the scenario you want to draw, um, instead of sticking that girl, uh, that gal, whatever, into a children's department or somewhere else in the church, filling the hole, we see where they're wired. Yeah, Jonathan. Well, kind of what I hear you saying, Dave, too, and where I'm at with it, is that the more we're into the vibe, like... The trellis is important, and we're doing the trellis yeah, work. Yeah. But when there's vine and fruit on the trellis, mm-hmm. and we're making disciples, and we're involved, and we're all engaged in the trellis work, then when there is a need, the pastoral team, the elders, and everybody else that is still involved knows, oh, goodness. Yes. So and so is incredibly gifted at that. Right. We have a need here. It's yeah. Like, Let's just pick somebody because they're there. Right. Because exactly. If there's fruit on that, that vine. Yeah. We're already engaged in knowing and, and being able to. Sure. Yeah, so both ends have to be at work. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Thanks for bringing clarity there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what he was saying, too, I think it's important to have a conversation with the individual and ask them where they see themselves serving. Sure. Um, My own personal experience, uh, because I'm a longtime educator, teacher, Mm -hmm. um, was, you know, at a different church, somebody saying, well, you'd be perfect for children's ministry. Here's the thing, though. Mm -hmm. Friday afternoon, I'm gassed. I'm tired. 
tired. Mm -hmm. I want to serve differently yeah. on Sunday. It's not that I don't love children, but I needed, just being honest, 25 years in the kindergarten teacher classroom, I needed a break. You do. <laughs> so I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, like, yeah, that's a gift, absolutely. Wouldn't argue with that. But yeah. also, maybe there are other talents. That, mm -hmm. that individual has. There you go. That's the key. And that's where the conversation has yeah. to come in. Mm -hmm. And just like the gentleman over here was saying, we have to know people yeah. so that we know where mm -hmm. their talents are and they may be multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah, I think the point of the book is we 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 get to know these people and then guess what? There is no trellis for that. Well, guess what we can build? That's it. A new trellis. Instead of trying to patch up the old one that's yeah. debilitated and yeah i say this as a motivator not to sound sound negative as it might but oddly enough this has not been my experience at west side for two and a half years that's been completely the opposite but here in the last week i've had three testimonies from people that have been coming here for a year two years three years who have never been spoken to never chatted with mm. invited into anything and i'm like that blows my mind because that was not my experience either experience yeah of what I'd heard about West Side, why I came to West Side, and then what I experienced here. Mm -hmm. But we are big. Now, of course, there's both sides of that coin. People have to get involved in, you know, membership, life group, life group. Oh, yeah. make some bit of effort. I know that's hard for some. Mm -hmm. But the more we're doing this, what we're doing now, it's going to be a lot better to have more feelers out to just, you know, make that that's person right. feel welcome. That's right. You yeah. know, invite them in, and, and at least. Then they can't say. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I had a, I had a, dis I had a conversation with the gal this last week. Been here a long time, and she was fairly upset because she didn't feel like um, um, she had been ministered to as she should have, and so on and so forth. And it was kind of an ongoing thing. And um, at the end of it all, when it was all uncovered, what was going on was at the end of the day. She wanted with what both her and I had in my past, which is what? Small church experience. Where the interaction with the lead pastor um, was constant because it was small enough community. It was just like a big family. Whereas, as I explained to her, if you and I are going to have that experience here, we better have a life group. We'd better be plugged into a smaller community within the greater community. That is where that happens. And this is, so that's, that's just vitally important. Yeah, good. Um, so how is, training this, how is training the solution to this problem instead of gap filling? Training. As an example, he just brought up is that people need to be aware of people who they don't know. Mm -hmm. If you see somebody in the commons or wherever you're involved in church, in the church on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whatever yeah. it is, and you see somebody in your, you should take the opportunity to go introduce yourself. Yes. And talk to them and engage with them. And that, you know, some people need to be trained to do that. They just don't have, they don't have the desire. And if you see somebody kind of stand out there on their own, that's our responsibility as a member of the church of the, sure. vine, of the vine to go out and be, you know welcome them in mm -hmm. and engage. Yeah. And so and that's and that's a I mean it's not an easy thing to do, but yeah. some people might need some a push. A little, yeah. A little yeah. push. Mm -hmm. And um, I I was going to give a quick example a few years ago. Um, after a Wednesday night program when we used to do some stuff here before we changed it, um, there was a couple of teenage girls that had locked themselves out of the car at the uh -oh. end of the program. And there was a couple of guys that I knew that had been former jail inmates. And uh, so I, I went over and, and grabbed them and I said, could you go help these two girls get their car opened up? 
and pretty soon somebody whipped out the proper tool and they, these girls were on their way <laughs> and they had a, they had a wonderful uh, engagement with these guys and and we had this uh, we had this moment of you know just kind of like you know God just kind of orchestrated that whole thing and we got all done and and one of the guys said one of the guys said to me why did you come to me when when that happened and I, and I said because I knew you were gifted in certain ways. <laughs> Yeah. You had an interaction with this yet these you young ladies, and you could minister to their need. Yeah. And yeah. so that's the part of knowing what yeah. somebody's gifts are. Yeah. Now that's kind of an extreme version, right? But, yeah. but that's the kind of stuff mm -hmm. that, that that was a God thing because yeah. God used the situation for a well. Let me uh, <laughs> let me play the devil's advocate a little bit um, because I look at you, Rick, and I go, you know, you're you're a lot like me in the sense that I don't think you struggle with getting to know new people, right? I mean, hey, look, look, I, when someone says that they're an introvert, I cannot relate to introverted situation. I'm not that. But there are a lot of us who are. So in that situation, what happens? I think you alluded to it, it's not easy. Um, it's harder for some than others of us. And so I, we get that. But a lot of times, it is just an issue of, uh, of, 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 of practice, of going out of your way, getting out of that comfort zone to meet those, those people. But yeah, 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 yeah. Were you going to say something? Uh, it's going back to the Great Commission mm -hmm. about teaching, you know, all yeah. the, and making disciples. Yeah. That's for all Christians. That's not just for the ones that are extroverted. That's right. That is yeah. for the introverted ones. So how do you accomplish that? It has to be uh, through training mm -hmm. and equipping where you're helping people move mm -hmm. into a stronger yeah. walk with the Lord, a deeper walk with the yeah. Lord, and then they're able to mm -hmm. access things they didn't know they had That's to right. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it's just something as simple as learning how to um, turn a conversation, how to pivot. You know, I learned that even in the insurance world. Um, half of insurance sales is listening to needs that they tell you they have. They tell you what they want, people will. And, um, and it's the same thing here, learning how to pivot, how to turn. Elias is constantly uh, teaching outreach classes didn't he? It's fantastic. Um, even including, you know, um, conversation starters and so on, how you pivot, those kind of things. And so those things are here, you know, off and on, but we have them. Yeah. I'm extremely introverted and I only know these two people in this church, really. You like me, Karen. But Joe really did exactly what you just said, because I went up to him one day and I said, why don't you have a library? You got all these books, you got all this stuff. Why don't you have a library? And he looked at me and said, we need a volunteer. And See? then he gave me Google Eyes. He had just been reading this. <laughs> he had just been reading that chapter. I know that because he told me the story. And, uh, yeah. I spent <laughs> dozens and dozens of hours yeah. as I'm starting to reorganize the library. That's great. I know. And we so appreciate you. It's on the way. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So, quickly. Um, we... Uh, why do ministries become problem focused? And what is the mind shift that needs to take place here? Going from page 22, paragraph two to four. Ministries becoming problem focused. What is the mind shift that needs to take place? <laughs> Putting out fires, right? Okay. Why do we do that? What's going on? I'm talking to me now, right? Well, those fires can become a black hole, and it really sucks all the energy to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and in and of itself. Yeah. And we think, oh, I'm doing ministry because I'm putting out fires. Yeah. See? And it gets us off of being intentional about the main thing. The fires are going to come, and you're going to have to deal with them. Can't ignore them. Um, but God is good. He's equipped us to do both. But we can never get to the place where, oh, I did ministry today because I put out another fire. We put out a lot of fires, believe me. Well, the um, says to be reactive instead of being reactive, be proactive. Proactive, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. 
So uh, we, we are running low on time. Um, same as last time under evaluate, um, the idea of, and this is uh, carrying on from where we were before. Uh, I took number one and we did the scripture. That was part of evaluate. So think of one or two ministries at Westside that you're a part of or care deeply about. Same kind of a format as last week. Are people seen as a necessary means of keeping the ministry going? Or is the ministry seen as, as, as existing for the training, equipping, and building of disciples? That's a hard question. Which is it? Think about those ministries that you're a part of or that you admire or whatever, that you look on with fondness, however you want to verbalize it. Which of those two is, is going on? This is family time. Be honest. What do you think? I think that question is like just two sides of the same page. It's just how you approach it. Sure. You know, it's you're trying to do ministry, but it's just how you look at it and what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to just concentrate on on what God wants you to do in those situations. Sure. Was what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Focus on what the Lord would have us do in that moment. That's good. Okay, anybody else on that one? I think accountability falls on the individual because truly the church, I think, really gives it the best to provide every bit of equipping, Classes, support, mm -hmm. I mean, everything that we possibly can. Yeah. But it's easy to get in the complacency mode. Yeah. You take life groups. If you've been a part of one for a while, it's easy to kind of get complacent with mm -hmm. just the fellowship of it. Mm -hmm. You have to remain accountable as a group and as an individual to be intentional sure. about the vine work within that ministry. And you know why that is? Because of the truth of Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, who can know it? We can deceive ourselves on so many levels and so many fronts. And so accountability, yeah, it's key. I can tell you this, I've been in ministry now 35 years. Yeah, this December we'll finish 34. So 35 years and I've never been a part of a church like this one. Um, or I mean, even exposed to one like this one in the sense of how healthy it is. Now, we're not perfect. <laughs> Believe me. Just hang around me for a week. Um, but we're doing a lot of things well. And the things we're not doing well, we're trying to correct. You know, should the Lord tarry. Um, and, and, and you got to remember, folks, listen, we are all sinners. And the quicker we learn that, that we're, you know, we're going to trip over each other and each other's blunders and each other's faults and each other's quirks. Um, I should bring Connie down here sometime. Just let her go off on all mine. But I, I won't because you won't want me up here anymore. Um, <clears throat> but the beautiful thing about that is a wonderful word called grace. The grace of God. And that's the way. When you receive it, isn't it good? It's even better when you give it. You extend it. It really is. So I hope that the people here, we're getting to the place where the people here are seen um, as those that we are training, equipping, and building rather than just there to keep a ministry going to keep a trellis together, right? That's, that's the goal. Okay. Um, I, think we'll, um, I think we'll leave off there. The ministry mind sh shifts that they talk about, that they discuss, there's 11 of them, you know, from running programs to building people, from running events to training people, all those. It was very insightful. I hope you got a lot out of those. So for take home, same thing as last time, under apply, where it says apply there, 
I want you to read through those and really and truly prayerfully, prayerfully go through them and answer them, would you? Uh, it's honor system around here. So um, please use that devotionally because otherwise the transformation that we're seeking through this series will not happen. We want you to go through these uh, and really prayerfully uh, answer them, okay? Ask the Lord to help you to be honest with yourself, uh, with each other if you're married here, uh, and go through these individually, together as a couple and so on. Um, I think it's great, okay? Anybody have any other questions or comments about this before we close in prayer? Anything? All right. Uh, get the word out about this. Bring some more people in here. And we'll get some more trained up in trellis. Uh, and by the way, if you're not part of a life group, guess what? I'm the life group guy. <laughs> so we'd love to plug you in. This is obviously why you're here. You're not part of a life group. So um, if that's the desire of your heart, and I hope it is, um, let's get you plugged into one. We want our life groups to be multi-generational. Now the part that's not really perfect about our life group or our life group ministry, uh, but we're getting there. We're, we're, we're getting there to where we're making them more and more multi-generational. The scriptures teach us very plainly that the older men, for example, are to be teaching the younger men, the older women teaching the younger women. And so that's what we're really after in, in all of our life groups. Yeah. Told to remind you, they, they put a whole bunch of new salvation tracks. On the oh, good. Yeah, we got our uh, salvation. What you must know tracks are here, uh, and I've got more in the drawer behind if if we run out. So those are great ways to. Uh, it's a great track for you understanding the major concepts of the gospel itself. Okay, uh, and so that's important. Grab one if you don't have one. Familiarize yourself with it. Start learning those verses. Memorize those verses that we put in there. Okay. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for, uh, for meeting us here tonight. Thank you for the good discussions, Lord, around the truths that we see uh, from your word that are outlined in this book. And we praise you and thank you tonight uh, for your call in our lives to be disciples uh, who are making disciples. And so we praise you tonight. We thank you for those that you've entrusted to us, uh, both around our homes, our neighborhoods, at work. Uh, Lord, those that you've entrusted to us to give them uh, the unsearchable riches of Jesus, that they might know their need of the Savior, and that we might be used, Lord, to your glory of bringing them uh, to you. And we thank you and praise you for these things tonight. Go with us now in your strength and in your power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good night, guys.